One of the basic images of the practice is that we're taking a refuge. And the idea of refuge, of course, assumes that there are dangers. And for us, primarily, are the dangers are inside. Our greed, aversion, and delusion can cause us all kinds of trouble. And it's in the recognition that there is that trouble, but also there's an escape from the trouble through our own actions. That's what lies at the basis of what the Buddha said is the most basic quality for being skillful, which is heedfulness. Realizing you have to be careful in choosing what you're going to do and say and think. That means you have to train the mind, because the mind is what gives the orders for what you do and say and think. So the dangers come from within, but the potential for going beyond the dangers also comes from within. There's a passage where the Buddha says that the mind is bright, but it's defiled by incoming or visiting defilements. The brightness here doesn't mean purity. It simply means your ability to recognize what you're doing, your, record, your ability to recognize when you're making a mistake and you're doing something unskillful. That's where the beginning of refuge lies, in recognizing that you can see your own actions and you can see when there's something wrong with them. That helps, of course, to have outside examples, outside advice, because one of our main problems inside is delusion, where white looks black, black looks white, right looks wrong, wrong looks right. This is why there's such an etiquette of respect around here. We find some good example in the example in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We show our respect for them, because that's the only way you're going to open up your heart to be willing to learn from them and accept their standards. Give them a try, at the very least. Respect doesn't mean total obedience, but it does mean giving the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha the benefit of the doubt, trying things on for a while, really sincerely testing what the Buddha has to say. Now, taking these things as a, a refuge, there are actually three levels. One on the external level is you take the Buddha and the Sangha as external examples. We've got the Dharma as instructions, but it's more than just instructions. You want to see examples, read of examples, of how these principles are put into action, because it's not just general principles. There's a theme that you hear banded around every now and then that when the Buddha talks about how admirable friendship is the entirety of the holy life, that what the Buddha is talking about is friendship with admirable qualities in yourself. Well, of course you want to be friendly with admirable qualities in yourself, but how are you going to recognize them unless you see them in someone else as well? And how are you going to know how to apply these general principles unless you see them in example? I know in my own case, most of what I learned about the Dharma was not what I heard from a John Fu or a John Suwan, was but being around them, watching them in action, watching them in different situations. And I don't know if I can set the same level example they did, but at the very least you can read in the canon about how the Buddha would handle different situations. That was one of the signs of the genius of the people who put the suttas together. It wasn't just about what the Buddha said, but it was how he behaved, how he handled different problems. You don't know how skillful some people, how human beings can be until you've seen someone who's really behaved skillfully in the face of difficulties, who knows how to put up with adversity, who knows how to defuse a really difficult situation, someone who can show patience, and someone who can be decisive when it's time to be decisive, and someone who has that sense of time and place. That's one of those things you just cannot pick up from reading books. So you need not only teachings in the Dharma, but you also need the examples of people who are skillful, 
to give you an idea of what's possible and what you can do, too. Because when you find a good friend like that, the whole point is to emulate their wisdom, emulate their generosity, their virtue, their conviction, what human beings can do. So that's one level of refuge, the external level. Then the next level is that you try to develop the qualities of that person within yourself, or of those people within yourself. Taking the example of the Buddha, his main virtues are three. There's discernment, purity, and compassion. And he gives instructions on how you can develop your own discernment, purity, and compassion. Discernment starts with that question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. And you don't just ask the question in a floating way. You look for good people to ask the question to. And they'll teach you about skillful behavior, avoiding killing, stealing, illicit sex, avoiding lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, learning how not to be greedy, learning how not to have ill will, learning how to develop right view. These are the things that are skillful. And asking that question, though, the reason why that's the beginning of wisdom. Because it embodies two principles. One is that your, your happiness is going to depend on your actions. You don't just sit around waiting for it to come. And then secondly, that long-term happiness is better than short-term. And you have to make that choice. Some people think that the whole question of short-term versus long-term is so obvious that you only have to talk about it, but people don't live their lives that way. It's very rare that you really do find someone who's able to sacrifice short-term happiness for something in the long term. That's the beginning of wisdom, and then learning how to talk to yourself. When you find that you're going to go for the short term, how do you dissuade yourself? And when you don't feel inclined to go for the long term, how are you going to convince yourself that it's necessary? And this is why heedfulness is so important. All too often you hear that we are simply learning to open up to our innately good nature. But if our nature were innately good, why is it that there are times when it's really difficult to do the skillful thing? And the mind finds it so easy to put up excuses. So here again, heedfulness is an important part of wisdom. Heedfulness also in informs the basis for developing purity, like in the Buddha's instructions to his son. You may have it as a general principle that you want to avoid harm, but then you really have to make sure that your actions are purely in line with that principle. And that requires that you look at your intentions and ask yourself when you're going to do something, what's your intention? What do you expect is going to come about as a result of this action? If you see it's going to be harmful, then you don't do it, regardless of how much you want to do it. While you're doing the action, you have to be carefully looking at what results you are giving rise to, because some results do come immediately. And again, even if you like doing the action, if you see that it's giving rise to harm either to yourself or to others, you stop. If you don't see any harm, you can continue. When you're done, you have to reflect on it again. Was there any long-term harm? If so, talk it over with someone who can give you good advice, and then resolve not to repeat that mistake again. If there's no long-term harm, then you can take joy in the fact that you're advancing in the training. Here again, the quest for purity is based on heedfulness, realizing that there's a lot of things you don't know and a lot of mistakes you can potentially make, even when you have generally good intentions, i.e. good intentions are not always skillful intentions, and you develop skill by reflecting on your actions. This means that developing the mind, training the mind, is not simply a matter of bringing it into the present moment, but it's all training, training you in how you approach the future and how you approach the past, i.e., the future in terms of what you intend to do and the results you intend to get out of your actions in the past, in terms of what you've actually learned from the past, your actions in the past. 
That's how you develop purity. As for compassion, there's that famous story about King Vasanadi and Queen Malika. In a tender moment, he turns to her, and they're, they're in the bedroom. He says, Who do you, Is there anyone you love more than yourself? Of course, he's expecting her to say, Yes, Your Majesty, you. And then the violins swell and the, the scene fades. But that's not what happened. She said, Well, no. There's nobody I love more than myself. How about you? The king has to admit that no, there's nobody he loves more than himself. So much for that. So he goes to report the conversation to the Buddha. And the Buddha says, you know, she's right. You could search the whole world and you'll never find anyone that you love more than yourself. And you'll also find that everybody, each person loves him or herself just as fiercely as you love yourself. And the conclusion the Buddha draws from that is that we should have compassion, never harm anybody. Again, this is heedfulness speaking. If you harm other people in your search for happiness, they're not going to stand for your happiness. It's not going to last. So you have to look for happiness that doesn't harm others. That's the beginning of compassion. So these are the ways in which you can take the qualities of the Buddha and develop them in yourself through your sense of heedfulness. That's the second level of refuge. The third level is when you actually attain the, the goal of the path. And we're all used to hearing nirvana as being the name of the goal, but this, it's one of many names that the Buddha gave to it. There are others like the island, security, be secure, shelter, harbor, refuge. And the goal is totally safe place of total safety. There are no more defilements. There's nothing in your mind that can create suffering anymore. Then you realize that the only suffering that really weighed the mind down was the stuff that the mind created for itself. That's the ultimate level of refuge when you reach that point. It's through your own actions, but it's also through the example and teachings of others that you learn how to examine your actions and gain good standards to judge them. So you can reach that ultimate level of refuge as well, which is why there are three levels altogether. Examples from outside, instructions from outside, that's the first level. The second is developing the qualities of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha within the heart as your practice. The ultimate level is when you finally attain the goal. It all comes out of heedfulness, seeing there are dangers, but if you're careful in how you choose to act, you can avoid those dangers and ultimately take yourself to a place where there are no dangers anymore. And it's important to have conviction in this, because you see so many times, I picked up a Buddhist magazine, and first it was the editorial that said that there was the force of desire in human life is so strong that it's folly to try to master it. And that was bad enough. And then you start looking through the different articles, and everybody seems to be saying the same thing. There is no true safety that you can attain through your actions. And that everything is learning about how to accept the difficult difficulties of life and just realize you can't go beyond them, but that's okay. Well, that's not what the Buddha taught. It is possible to go beyond them. We've got his example. So we want to make sure that modern Dharma doesn't blind us to that example. Because otherwise we'll never find the refuge that the Buddha works so hard to discover for himself and to teach to others. For it's, so it's for our own good and for the good of everybody else that so we try to keep that example alive.